Well, firstly, and before we get started, I just want you to know that anyone who's sitting in the very front row here gets a free drink. But I guess it's just you, I know. <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, you know, in, in general, at any one of these conferences, it's always lovely to be here speaking to people working in industry and doing fantastic work. Um, but this one's special to me because this is my hometown. Um, I'm from Brisbane. I went to school across the river at QUT. I'm just gonna set this because I do have a timer I have to keep. Um, I went to school across the river at QUT and when I was in college here, um, the tech industry in Queensland in particular was pretty nascent. Um, there was not an enormous amount going on. Uh, it was, you know, Australian banks, branch offices for international companies. I was doing a hybrid arts and computer science degree. And I remember that the most exciting project that was going on in that part of the industry in Queensland at the time was a CD-ROM about acupuncture for horses. Um, which probably tells you a little bit about how long ago it was. <laughs> um, so it was really an honor to be asked to come here and speak with folks in Brisbane, um, knowing that the state of computer science and the tech industry and the kinds of work that folks here are able to do is, has become really exciting, um, but also that Brisbane can feel really far away. Um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily the first choice on anyone's international uh, destination list coming in from overseas, although they're wrong about that. They should come here. It's beautiful. Um, but, you know, I, I hopefully if you're local, if, especially if you're early in your career, you'll get a chance to come, you know, come visit California and hang out, but go to Europe, go elsewhere. Um, it's really a fairly tightly woven international community of experts, particularly in the distributed systems space. Um, Yao and other conferences, uh, I spoke at QCon a couple months ago, um, are really excellent conferences. And the community of folks who come in and through those is really supportive and um, also much funnier than energy conferences is one of the big takeaways that I have. Uh, since switching into the energy industry a few years ago, uh, far less jokes in the slides, like zero Lord of the Rings references. They really fall flat. Um, and, and consequently, you may find that there are less jokes in my slides today than there would have been in a past life. But with that, I will go ahead and get started. Now, the topic of my talk is talking about building the next generation grid. Um, that's what my company now focuses on. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the ways that we can take the lessons learned from pioneering work in cloud computing and in large-scale distributed computing, um, particularly around the idea of repeatable patterns, design patterns for systems architecture, design patterns for distributed systems, and apply those in open-ended ways to new challenges in related industries as well. So I'll go ahead and start talking about that. Very likely. Clicky click. Maybe not. You know what? There's two clickers up here. Yeah. Hey, I had the wrong one. Um, all right, so you guys may have heard of climate change. Um, I really should have swapped this slide out with a picture from Brisbane um, because the rate of 100-year floods has really gone up a lot in the last 10 years. Um, but nonetheless, this is an increasingly present aspect in all of our lives. Um, this is, um, in my view, the largest problem that we face as humans and the most important work that I could think of to be doing with my time. Um, even just in the last 10 years, I feel like the experiences that each of us have had with climate impacts generally are more personal, more close to home. If you're here in Australia, you will have experienced flooding, bushfires, et cetera. In California, where I live now, um, we've seen a massive increase in fire risk. Um, this picture is from Florida, um, where the rate of uh, large-scale flooding uh, from increasingly intense hurricanes is causing increased natural disasters. Um, but you know, even if you haven't necessarily suffered personally from climate disasters, although unfortunately more of us have, um, there's also just kind of looking at the future, right? I have, an, I have a nine-year-old son. Um, I plan to retire here on Earth, where all my stuff is. Um, I would like it to be nice, 
um, you know, or at least not substantially worse. And so that's really um, why I chose to make my next move in tech, not into tech per se, but into the work of applying some of the things that we had learned about large-scale systems infrastructure um, to this terribly important problem. Now, one thing that people will often ask me about when, you know, when I talk with them about working in climate um, is, you know, is it too late? Like, are we already done? Um, maybe, maybe we should just, you know, maybe it's too late to do anything. Um, and the thing that I want to tell you and my call to action here today is that every fraction of a degree counts. There's not one tipping point where the problem is unsolvable. There is not one moment when it's too late. Every action that we take builds a better future. Every fraction of a degree that we save makes the world better going forward, avoids worse outcomes and preserves more of the world that we were all privileged to grow up in for the next generation and generations to come. Um, and that, to me, is the most hopeful thing that I could tell you. Anything you do matters, anything at all. It could be a large thing, it could be a small thing, it could be in your personal life, it could be in your work life. You, know, you don't necessarily have to quit your job at Google and go start a climate startup to make a difference. There are many, many, many things that all of us can do. Um, but I'm going to talk about the one that I picked. So, so just a really quick primer on our energy system and what it means to decarbonize our energy system. Um, and just to, just to sort of give context to this, when we think about decarbonization, um, there are parts of the decarbonization problem that are related to energy, and there are parts that are related to other factors such as land use. Energy represents about two-thirds of the problem space, once you include both electricity and also all other forms of energy usage, which need to be also decarbonized, including transit and industry and so forth. Um, and so the, the kind of two-step plan for decarbonizing the energy system is really very simple. Okay, we electrify everything. Um, excellent, all electrified. Then we decarbonize the grid. Um, the reason we electrify everything is really that electricity is our best, is, is our best vector for clean energy. Um, getting electricity directly from sun, wind, hydro, nuclear accounts, um, and putting it to work and doing all of the things that energy needs to do um, is by far more efficient. In fact, it's so much more efficient that once you begin with the premise of electrifying everything, you've already solved 40% of the problem. Um, and that's because you're just not uh, losing efficiency in burning fossil fuels to heat water, to make steam, to make electricity. By the time you've gotten that far, like you're pretty far behind. So you know, the good news is that we have technologies that can generate clean electricity. Um, we have technologies that can help us to move along this transition path to electrifying everything. Um, the only catch is we've got about like 10, 15 years to do it in developing nations. Um, and there's a lot of work to do, like a hell of a lot of work to do. But in my mind, there's a few things that are really hopeful about this. Like one is we have the technology we need. There is no silver bullet we haven't invented yet to solve this problem. Now, the downside is that, that those technologies come in a number of forms. They come in the form of clean generation. They come in the form of flexible demand. They come in the form of transitioning many energy uses to, electrical, uh, to electrically powered. Um, and that's a really big problem space. Uh, but it's also a distributed systems problem. How do you get lots and lots and lots, millions, billions of things to work together across a broadly interconnected network? Well, that's not so different from the challenge of getting lots, millions or billions of computers or processors or containers or whatever to work together across a globally connected network. It's actually very nearly the same problem from a software perspective. Um, now, there are many parts of this that are not software, um, but software is really important. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways that the patterns of distributed system development that we built um, during my time at Google and uh, work in scaling Google's global systems are actually really applicable to this problem space, how we're putting them to work today. Um, and then I'll talk hopefully just a little bit at the end about um, where we stand. And Australia is actually a very interesting place to be doing this work because in a lot of ways Australia's um, version of this problem 
uh, the challenge of managing a very renewable grid is much more advanced than other places in the world, and that's mostly due to the role of rooftop solar. So just really quickly, brief lesson on the grid. Um, the grid is composed of a number, basically a large, a large amount of physical infrastructure, wires, but also a trend, transmission uh, lines, poles, uh, transformers, et cetera, that basically connect um, all sources of electrical energy to all users of electrical energy. Basically has two parts. Um, there's the transmission grid, which is the big bit of the grid that goes a long distance, has like big metal towers, look like kind of giant dinosaurs. Um, and those, that's, that's the part of the grid that connects uh, mostly large generation to the places where people live. And then there's the distribution grid, and that's effectively kind of the last mile of the, of the grid's network. So you could think of it as being like sort of like the internet backbone versus like last mile network connectivity. Um, those are often different uh, utilities manage different parts of that network. And all of the demand side of the grid is connected to the distribution network. Now, one of the really big challenges of incorporating renewables onto the grid is basically that um, renewables are very variable and um, they generate when the hell they want to. So in order to make that, net, that, make that load balancing problem work out, matching supply and demand instantaneously in real time at all times. If you can't change when you generate, you have to change when you use energy. And so that's, that's the other half of this system's problem. It's like how, do you, how do you gather up all of those sources of flexible demand and actually get them to play a balancing role in load balancing the grid of the future? So I like to think about like, the, the job of the future grid or management of the grid as being very simple. It's getting energy from the time and place where it's produced to the time and place where it's needed. That is a really different way of managing the grid than it stands today. It's even a little bit different than our load balancing problems in the large scale internet system space because those are typically still pretty instantaneous. Um, but this is, this is the same kind of very large scale load balancing problem, only it's also about balancing over time. So I think it's really interesting. Um, when I first got engaged in this space, I thought it would be kind of like the work I had done at, in large scale systems at Google, but maybe a little more boring. Um, that was very arrogant. It's actually a much harder and more interesting problem, um, but that's awesome because that's kind of what I signed up for. I love hard problems. I love big systems problems, and I really prefer it if nobody knows the answers because that leaves a lot of space to figure them out. So, one of the first challenges in the grid management space, and this is also part of the reason why I decided it would be um, meaningful for, for me and the folks that I had worked with in the past to be involved. Um, firstly, technology sucks. It's really not that great. Um, most grid management infrastructure today is run on on-prem systems. Um, that consequently means that anything around cloud scale data, hyperscale computing, um, genuine big data approaches, et cetera, no go, none of that. Um, I hope you didn't need all that data because we threw it away. Um, you know, at one point, someone uh, who was working with one of the US utilities in California was telling me about the scale of data th that they were collecting from their smart meter system. And they were like, if you burned it to DVDs and stacked them up, just one day's worth of data would be as tall as the building. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's not big data. That's like really tiny data. Come on, guys. Like, we can do better than this. This is what the cloud is for. Um, but utilities are still slow moving into the cloud space. In Australia, that's a little bit different. Um, in the US, it's very, very conservative. It's still a work in progress. Um, I'm actually really excited about the, the precedent being set in Australia around use of the cloud for managing energy systems, because um, it's something that kind of helps to move other people's thinking along. Um, but it's definitely um, a, a really big lift to get from the sort of 90s era um, on-prem, uh, very data-starved systems to the large-scale computing systems that we need to be able to manage like a massively distributed grid of the future. Um, so you, know, you probably have a sense now for what my company does. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about like, approaches that we use and so forth. Um, we're a relatively small company. Um, we do grid scale management software for utilities. Um, we work with utilities primarily in the US today. Um, but we also do a lot of um, work connecting people between different parts of the community. It's actually one of the things that I think is most important about what we do. Um, is helping to connect folks from the research space to the practical space to the policy space 
trying to bring in work from Australia to the US, trying to bring work from the academic space into the industry space in the US. Um, because this is a problem where there's a lot of really, really smart people working on it, but the, the solution space is, it spans many disciplines. And that's always a really great place for systems engineers, um, and it's one of the reasons I love it so much. So, I mentioned learning from experience. Um, before I go into a little bit of my background and like some of those lessons learned, um, I just want to take a moment and talk about terminology um, because it's super confusing. So I mentioned that the grid has two parts. There's the transmission system and the distribution system. Um, when we talk about distributed systems in the grid space, people ab have absolutely no, no clue what we're talking about. They're like, distribution system? Um, and because of that, like, I've started to talk about it in the energy industry as hyperscale computing instead, which is, kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but I think of it as being distributed systems, the work that we do. Um, but important to note that there's just uh, some terminology confusion. Um, and so, you know, as I talk about the parts of the grid, um, just uh, be, be aware that uh, one piece is talking about wires, physical infrastructure, poles, that sort of thing. Um, when we talk about distributed systems, we're really talking about like systems management and software approaches. So you probably heard in, in my bio that um, I did a lot of work at Google on microservices infrastructure and frameworks infrastructure. Um, and, but what I started out doing at Google was working in the site reliability engineering team um, at the, the very beginning of Google's transition to what basically is their internal cloud today. Um, this was in 2004, and it was uh, when they were rolling out their internal uh, cloud platform. Um, it was about two years before the first publicly recorded use of the term cloud, and it was really, really, really new. Um, anything that's cloud-based effectively needs to be microservices-based. And I, I, I love these two pictures. Um, I, see this, I see the picture of the dinosaur with the flamingos on it go around the internet every now and then. Um, and it's often accompanied by a distributed systems joke, which makes me happy because it was a distributed systems joke. Um, this dinosaur is in Google's uh, little park area in their, their, what used to be their headquarters buildings. Um, and we, we rolled in one day to install an entire flock of flamingos on it um, basically, it's a joke about transitioning from centralized systems to distributed ones. Um, so it always makes me happy when I see it come back around with like no particular attribution, because I'm like, man, that joke clearly worked. Like it had some legs. It's pretty awesome. Um, but when I was starting that work, um, the site reliability team only had about 20 people in it. Um, I was actually hired as a technical writer. My job was to document the cloud, which was in the process of being invented. Um, and I transitioned over the next couple years into a uh, site reliability and engineer and management role and took over uh, the team that was running Google's global web serving layer. And we, we built out Google's kind of global web serving platform. Um, I carried a pager for Google.com for about five years. My team was responsible for the homepage. Um, between myself and the traffic team, that is Google's global, global availability. Um, nobody knew how to run a distributed system at the time. Um, there was nobody we could hire that typically it's very hard to hire anyone who had worked on more than about 10 computers at once. Um, whereas we were suddenly trying to you know, build out teams to work on hundreds of thousands to millions. Um, because it was a new space, we had to figure out a lot of stuff as we went along. Um, and because it was a new space, you know, anytime there's new technology coming along like this, it's a wonderful career opportunity as well. So like I started at Google as a technical writer. I moved into managing an SRE team. I managed Google's global availability for about five years. Um, went on to go lead up a lot of internal infrastructure development, basically taking what we had learned um, and trying to generalize that to make it more accessible and easier for others to engage with. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of those patterns um, because as we were going through this work, you know, sort of first, second, and third time, you're not really trying to generalize, ideally, the first time you solve a very large scale problem. Um, you're just trying to solve your problem, right? You're like, okay, well, now I have like 10 times as many backends as I used to. How do I distribute traffic across them? My large, like, big iron F5 load balancers are choking with the number of backends. They can't do the health checks. Like, what do we do now? Um, but as you go through those problems over and over and begin to iterate, um, there's basically like 
a set of patterns that develop um, which become applicable in, I think, any problem space that's fairly new. And you'll start to recognize those coming out again and again and again. So I'm going to talk about like, some of those kind of basic technology building blocks. Um, and these were things that, you know, as we were sort of working through these problem spaces over time, um, these were the sort of technology components which were really foundational to understanding how to build these large-scale systems and how to make sure that they work effectively um, and how to make sure that they, you can basically build the systems fabric to get 99.995% reliability out of effectively a bunch of junk parts. So one of the things that was really interesting about Google's reliability approach was that they were so desperate for hardware um, during their kind of primary scaling period, like 2002 to 2006, um, that they were buying parts off the back of trucks, um, boards that had been returned to the manufacturer, um, RAM with like known hardware faults, um, and their philosophy was building reliable systems on unreliable hardware, very explicitly. They, they, it, they didn't even try to make sure that the underlying machines were reliable. They were like, whatever, they'll catch on fire. It's the software's job to fix that. How do you fix that in software? Well, you better be pretty resilient to the failure of any individual machine. Um, you better be able to move load around really effectively. You better be able to uh, compensate for loss of access to critical data. So data needs to be in multiple places. No individual instance can be material. Um, every piece of work needs to be able to be moved. That's the work of an orchestration system. You need really good sense of what's going on, which is why the role of large-scale monitoring is so foundational to reliability in large-scale systems. Um, you need to be able to move all of that work around instantaneously if something fails. Um, and you need to be able to do that in a way that's reasonably resource efficient. And those building blocks underlie nearly everything we built. Uh, oh, and it needs to be really simple too, um, because otherwise no one will be able to run it. The more complex it is, the, the more it's consuming the cognitive bandwidth of the team, um, which you guys have heard plenty about from others. Uh, and if you can't model it in your head, then you can't run it effectively. So all of that, but like really easy, uh, which is cool, right? It's like very, very straightforward. Um, so there were a few things that we learned in terms of patterns and repeatability as we were going through this process. Um, one is that, as I mentioned earlier, it, you should never try to generalize something the first time you do it. Um, on the other hand, I also don't believe you can build effective infrastructure without a customer. And so there's this process of slowly you know, kind of learning from experience and then scaling that outwards to make sure that it's generally applicable um, and that it can be reused effectively without being overly specific, and without being overly complicated. Um, I saw a lot of teams do this, dozens to hundreds. I ran many myself. Some of them succeeded, some of them failed. Um, but generally speaking, this pattern of like, okay, try it. Okay, try it two or three more times and figure out what's general. And then try it with the biggest one you can possibly find is my best pattern for success. Um, and so that's, that process is how we came to um, a lot of the early infrastructure that we put together today. So, I want to talk a little bit about putting this to work. Um, and this is in the context of the grid, but like, it's sort of generally applicable to, I think, nearly any industry or, or any comparable problem. Um, I like to use the, the sort of foundational example of um, the hierarchy of reliability, which is out of Google's SRE book, which, sorry, Google, I'm not a huge fan of it. You can talk to me offline about why, but um, there's some really good stuff in it. Um, but, and in particular, uh, this, this view of the role of systems engineering, site reliability engineering um, in making large scale systems reliable, um, I think is really helpful. Uh, but also, if you look at it, if you take this, you apply it to the grid, you're like, okay, where do we stand on you know, general systems engineering infrastructure, reliability approaches, et cetera? Um, okay, we start with monitoring. Do we have any monitoring? Uh, we, we don't, I'm gonna get to that in just a second. So just as an example, you know, here's a sort of simplified view of what an electrical grid might look like. Very much like any other network, a lot of connectivity to end nodes that have work to do. Um, in this case, these would be like houses and buildings and so forth. So I mentioned there's kind of the large scale network, connects everything, um, connects generation to the places where people live. Um, very well instrumented, it's a pretty simple network, typically a mesh. Uh, lots of good real-time visibility, great start. Uh, there's some visibility into the behavior of 
end users in this system, but typically only very large ones. Um, there are a lot of a lot of smart devices out on the consumer side that could participate. Um, very little visibility to zero visibility into what those guys are up to. Uh, and once you get down to the local network of the grid, the distribution side, uh, data is shitty. There's really not that much out there. Um, most smart meters collect and can provide data with a delay of like two to 24 hours at best. Um, pretty much no utilities really instrument comprehensively below the substation and the substation infrastructure. Um, really hard to tell what's happening down at the edges of the grid. It's not, it, the data sources that are out there are not fantastic. And so when we look at the problem of like, how do we get this network to work differently? You're like, okay, well, I actually have no instrumentation whatsoever about how loaded it is. I don't know the network capacity. I don't know what's happening at any constraint point. Um, I, can, I can guess, I can model it, but I cannot measure it. So that's like kind of a hard place to start when you're thinking about taking this existing physical infrastructure and doing something different with it. Um, everything okay? Mm, hard to say. Uh, so what utilities do today is basically they project load for the next 10 years, um, and then they build all of their equipment by 10x what they think their peak requirement will be. And then they're like, job well done. Um, and they wait, basically literally wait for people to call them on the phone and be like, my power's out. Um, that's the worst case. Um, some are better than this today. Some can actually tell when your power's out. That's a good improvement. Um, but that is basically what utility real-time operations looks like on the distribution side today. So it's like not a, not a promising start for like real-time system reliability approaches, but let's talk about what we can do about that. So firstly, it's not like there's no data. There's some data. It's just like not real-time. It's not super useful. It's definitely not the kind of large-scale monitoring infrastructure that like I would like to see or I'm used to working with as someone coming from a place like Google. Um, but there's not nothing. And so this is actually like sort of the first place where we start looking at um, machine learning and deep learning approaches because we do have some data. We know a lot about the state of the, and the nature of the system. Um, putting machine learning to work and doing like point forecasts of what's happening at basically every endpoint on the grid um, and then matching that against data sources all the way up the system with increasing fidelity as you get more towards that well-instrumented backbone. Um, can give you like a pretty decent sort of pseudo real-time synthetic view of what's happening out there on the grid. And now this is really just kind of papering over the lack of real-time data infrastructure. Um, for a lot of problem, for a, lo a lot of use cases, you really need that real-time infrastructure. Um, but it it's at least gives us a place to start as like systems people to build uh, systems which can then do work on top of this network. And what kind of work do we want to do? Well. I mentioned that one of the really big challenges of uh, managing the transition to a highly renewable grid is the, the sources of generation are intermittent. Um, but, it also, but as we also add like a lot more sources like solar, um, they're also time-based. So wind is time-based, but it varies a lot. Solar is very distinctly time-based during the day. So you start to change the patterns of usage on the grid infrastructure. Um, and because today's utilities mostly can't see what's happening, um, that scares the crap out of them uh, because they didn't really plan for that. And they, if there were to be sudden changes, like cloud goes over the sun and all that load ends up traversing the network instead of not traversing the network, they're pretty blind to when that might happen and what the impact of it might be. Um, today, not such a big problem, except here in Australia where it's starting to get really spicy, um, and Hawaii as well. Uh, but tomorrow, like, pretty big problem. Um, we're going to have th at least 3x the demand on the grid uh, by 2035. We need a lot of that load to be flexible. We need a lot of storage. We need a lot of renewables. And so when we get that far, what we really need is a view of the grid that looks a lot more like the consoles that I hope all of you have when you look at your systems, where you can go to it and be like, what's it doing right now? Oh, that's great. Everything's fine. Um, oh, it's broken. I wonder where it's broken. Uh, we need that for the grid, and we need tools to do something about it. Uh, and in particular, being able to leverage things like storage and flexible load to make sure that this system, it continues to work reliably as it changes very, very rapidly is a really big part of this solution space. Um, so this starts, to, this starts to become a question of network efficiency, really. If we want the existing network to do about three to four times the work that it's doing today, 
um, you know, we can either build a shit ton more network or we can take advantage of all of that capacity that is sitting on the floor today because the networks are highly overbuilt. Building more network is really challenging because people don't like transmission lines in their, back, in their backyard. And in built up areas, building a lot more distribution network is also very challenging as well. Um, getting more efficiency out of the current network is basically our path forward here. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about, um, just looking at these technology solutions, is really focused on that. So there's a lot that we can do to kind of leverage the behavior of these end nodes. Um, but it's also, as, uh, as more of them begin to participate in uh, programs which allow them to respond to being flexed in response to the role of renewable generation, the more complex the network situation becomes. Places where we weren't overloading it are now overloaded. Um, the more that happens, the more expensive upgrades are required to make it possible to continue to add services. So the example that I like to use is, um, imagine that you've got a bus depot and you're converting it to electric buses. Um, it didn't used to be a particularly interesting location from an electrical system perspective, but now that you're adding 10 EV buses, um, suddenly there's a ton of demand and the local infrastructure you know, may, may or may not be able to handle that. If that's just one bus depot, you can handle that by just upgrading that infrastructure. It'll take a couple of years, you'll be done. If it's every bus depot in the city, you have a much bigger and more expensive problem. And so this is where it starts to look really attractive to bring in software solutions. What if you just manage the bus loading, so the bus charging cycle, so that it avoided generating any problematic peaks? Well, that could be really useful. Um, you could actually really get a lot more capacity out of the existing network, but you would need visibility and moreover, you would need to trust the software to not blow anything up. Because if you get it wrong in software, smoke comes out of electrical equipment and people lose their power, very bad. So then you've got a problem that looks you know, partly like a technical problem, but also partly like a people problem. And probably a bunch of folks here are familiar with how this works, right? It's not just can you build the right technology solutions, it's also could you get people to trust them? Will they adopt them? Will they be able to roll them out? Will they work well enough at scale? All of these kinds of questions. And so this is where you start to get to the human side of reliability engineering approaches. Um, one of the big takeaways for me from a lot of the work that we did at Google through you know, many iterations of scaling, um, I, I think I calculated that it was about a 10 million X growth, uh, growth curve in terms of overall just like QPS. Um, is that as you get more and more complexity in the system, you do require automation to handle it. But as an operator, if an engineering team comes to me and they're like, hey, I built you the automation system, I'm basically like, get out. <laughs> I don't want to hear from you about your automation system. Did you ask me about it? Like, do you know anything about this? Um, typically, this is more successful if you're working in really close partnership between the engineering organization that's building the tool and the people who actually have to use it to keep the system up and running. Um, and this is kind of the heart of the SRE or DevOps type approach, right? Is that tight partnership between the software engineering work and the operation of the system where you can be learning how to adapt to the needs of the system as it grows. Um, and you can safely increase automation in places where that helps you to get more people efficiency, more network efficiency, better performance, et cetera. So when we look at this, just as an example, um, in the grid space, you know, that starts by having better visibility and starts by uh, having an understanding of what's happening out there on the grid. But then we can start to move through the challenges of, um, managing an increasingly complicated network environment um, by adding automation in the right places. But I think it's really important to remember what automation is for. It's not just to have like a really great system. It's not necessarily to have the system be completely self-driving or anything like that, although I'm gonna talk about at the very end like how we might get there. Um, but it's really first and foremost to help people manage the complexity of the systems that we're building. Um, and so, you know, using, kind of working through this as an example, I'm not necessarily gonna really focus you know, on exactly like the details of the grid technology associated with this, but if you're interested, you should definitely hit me up and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, you know, we start to look at like, okay, if we're gonna introduce automation, how does that work? Um, so 
I think one of the nice repeatable patterns of the distributed systems space is basically this idea of hierarchies of work. Um, so if you look at it from the perspective of like a computing system, you know, your, your, your most local node is always gonna be like the server or the container that contains code that's doing work. Um, and typically it has a local job and it's always gonna be a much more resilient node if it has enough local state to do that relatively independently, checking back with the rest of the system occasionally perhaps, but it's sort of fundamentally able just to do its own job. Um, if it fails, it's the job of the orchestration system to be like, get me another. Um, but so long as it can do its work reasonably independently, you've got like this nice little node that you can build outwards from for a more reliable system, right? Like, it's cool, I don't need to hear from the rest of you for the next five minutes, I'm just gonna do my work. So when we look at this in the grid context, like what does that look like? Well, that looks like the, the Tesla battery or the Enphase battery at your house has a job. It's to take power from your solar array, uh, store it, and then when your house demand exceeds the output of the solar array, it will give you some power back and spread some of your solar usage into the evening. That's a very simple job. That battery can do its job without talking to anybody about it. Um, the way that utilities manage reliability for this today, and this is as far as we've gotten from an industry perspective, is basically just to check at installation time that those assets are not too large, that they'll explode the transformer. Um, but as we get more and more of them, that gets more complicated, and also the transformers get expensive if you need to upgrade them. So it, that, that becomes complex very quickly. But if you start with this like unit of work that you can do locally, whether it's a server or a battery or whatever, you know, you've got something you can work from. So as we start to move upward, there's kind of this question about like, okay, well, what do you need to know from the network in order to be able to operate effectively? What do you need to know from the centralized system in order to be able to operate effectively? Well, in the example I gave you with the you know, hundreds of bus depots around the city, you know, probably each of those needs to know what's my safe charging and discharging window. How do I make sure I'm not blowing up any physical equipment when I plug in 25 buses to charge? Um, and so starting to develop an idea of virtualized capacity and be able to communicate that periodically to the local devices now gives them a policy that they can work from so when they're working independently, um, they have information about how to be good network citizens. And so this is starting to look like a little bit more like dynamic capacity management or dynamic management of work. Um, this is also the point at which you might wanna leverage those resources to do a job. Um, and so this is where you know, giving tools to a grid operator to be able to say like, oh, I'm switching the physical network around this location and I need you to use less power today allows them to start to work that into their existing workflows. And again, this is like a small additional step, but it's one that begins to get a lot closer to the idea of being able to leverage our existing physical infrastructure as a distributed system and as a dynamic system. Once you have those kinds of basic tools, um, now we have our ingredients for folks like you know, me to come in and be like, okay, all right, I know the capacity of every point on the grid. I used a lot of computers to figure that out. Um, I have a little map um, of how much anyone's allowed to use out there. I can give each of them that map. Um, and I can just tell them, like, don't violate any of your constraints. Um, this is uh, black magic in the utility space. If we can get this far in a widespread way in the next five to 10 years, we'll actually probably helpfully address a number of our electrification challenges. Um, but this is also where it starts to get really fun from a software perspective, right? Um, and then ultimately, you know, we don't just want to be able to like, get 10 you know, bus depots or 100 bus depots added to the grid um, as, as uh, uh, EV charging locations, we wanna be able to get everybody, every car, uh, every, every heating device, um, every fleet charging location, every bus depot, trains, et cetera, everything needs to go on. And so ultimately, um, we need to be able to optimize uh, a lot of very complex usage of that existing network. And we wanna do two things. We wanna both take account of network capacity. It needs to be cheaper because um, sorry, no one cares enough about decarbonization to do it if it's not at least a little bit cheaper. Um, and it also actually needs to address the carbon problem. So now you have what looks more like a load balancing problem and a kind of a fun systems optimization problem. 
Um, and we're then doing multivariable optimization for network capacity, cost constraints, and carbon constraints. Um, and this is where it starts to get, I think, really, really fun from a technology perspective and also really, really relevant from a decarbonization perspective because now we have this, the tools that we need to be able to affect the behavior of all of these end nodes to get them to use power when it's least carbon, ideally, um, and make sure that when they are optimizing their behavior that they're optimizing it in a way that actually solves the problems that we came here to solve. So from a trustworthiness perspective, you know, we have the answers to how to make software trustworthy even in critical applications, right? It needs monitoring, it needs alerting, it needs really comprehensive testing, operator tools, fail safes, it needs trust. Um, and it needs to be embedded in a trustworthy way, not just into the technical systems, but also into the people systems of all the folks who need to interact with this. So this is not just a matter of like standing these things up and getting them working, it's also a matter of working with the operations teams at the utilities to be like, your job's gonna be different, let's talk about how that is. Working with their management, your job's gonna be different, let's talk about how that is. Many of you have probably had these kinds of conversations and that's honestly the hardest part of any large scale distributed systems transition is getting people to think differently about their infrastructure. So I'm gonna talk about just a couple of other things that we learned about doing work in places where the cost of failure is very, very high. Um, one of the big differences in working on the grid versus working with computer and computing systems is that while there are some applications in computing systems where failure is a really big problem, um, in general, what it means is that your website is down, um, not that something's gonna blow up. Um, however, there are a number of places, there are industries where the failure profile you know, does involve real risk to physical infrastructure. Um, a good friend of mine and a former colleague, uh, uh, he was running Google's traffic SRE team um, when I was running the web serving front end SRE team, um, went from that job to go head up software for SpaceX, um, where they were developing systems that are basically autonomously managing rockets. So this is actually something I sat down and talked with him about. It was like, okay, you're like, how does this set of approaches look different if your assets can blow up? And you basically don't get to run them over and over and over again to see you know, if they fail occasionally. One of them blows up, that's a really, really big deal. Um, and so what we talked a lot about was the role of simulation um, and how that becomes much more prominent in environments where there's an enormous amount of physical equipment risk. This applies to anything in aerospace, um, autonomous vehicles as well. Um, if you run over a pedestrian, you can't unrun over them. You better not do it in the first place. Um, although I wish all autonomous vehicle driving companies took this quite as seriously. Um, now my friend now runs software for Boeing um, and has taken a lot of these approaches successfully into the aerospace area. Um, but this was really helpful to us in just kind of thinking about the centrality of large scale simulation. Um, for being able to build in the lab and then take it effectively to the field. Um, but that also means that there is a process, there is a point in this process every time at which you do have to take it like out into production in a place where it affects physical equipment and physical infrastructure. But the good news is this is where you know, our, our computing system reliability practices really come into play. Um, the idea of canarying a change wholly unknown to utilities. Um, generally speaking, what they'll do is have a pilot where they're like, we did it to 10 houses for five years. Okay, now we're gonna do it everywhere. Um, it's like, well, did you try it? Uh, like after five years of technology change, like you're gonna do it to stage rollout or what? Um, that's not really, they don't really think in systems terms about um, engaging with software um, in sort of a modern iterative software approach way. That's very foreign. They think about it in terms of capital development projects where it's like, okay, I've designed the power plant. I commissioned the power, I built the power plant. I commissioned the power plant. I turned it on. And that's how they think about software a lot. But bringing these approaches from the reliability engineering space for things like continuous deployment, continuous testing, um, testing of individual components, canarying in particular locations of the grid, and doing that like every, every week or two weeks is as useful in the grid context as it is in any computing context. And so this is one of the things that I feel has been really helpful as we've gone through this process is just that over and over, what we have seen is that the things that are most helpful in tackling this really interesting, really hard problem 
are the things that we brought in with us from problems that were similar um, and from uh, spaces where there is good practice to draw from. Um, one of the guys that I uh, was working with at my company, someone who came in from the research side, um, had a, an observation in the context of grant projects, um, which I think applies to basically any technology project. He was like, there is room for one, maybe two miracles. More than that, and the project will fail. Um, and I think that that's true for any technology project, really. The more you can leverage existing practice, the more you can leverage existing technology, um, the more you can lever leverage things that are de-risked, um, the more you're going to enable any really um, spectacular new pieces of development or new pieces of work to be successful because they're building on a foundation that is known. So when you're doing new innovative things, when you add them, they have a much higher likelihood of at least uh, you know, only failing in ways that are contained to the new work and not because the underlying systems were too novel or too um, fragile. So now I'm going to talk about what this looks like in the limit. Um, I mentioned that you know, we want to get to a place where we've got like millions to billions of interactors on the grid. You know, just, just like my old systems, you know, back at the ranch, um, you know, potentially, potentially millions on any particular grid, probably you know, in the billions once you figure smart toasters into the equation. Although, frankly, I'm not sure that my toaster needs to be super smart. But, um, you know, we've got a, a network that starts to look a lot more like a very large scale distributed system. Um, and what we know is that technology, in, in terms of technology, we can absolutely get there. Um, but we need to make sure that this change is reliable. We need to make sure that it's safe. We need to make sure that it's tested. We need to make sure that people can continue to reason about it. So starting to think about you know, what are those units of autonomy and the hierarchies that make it so that anyone who's sitting you know, at a desk operating a grid, same as you're sitting at your desk operating a, a computing system, um, can not worry about many large parts of it unless they're broken. So you know, we talked about that like, unit of autonomy being the individual server or the individual container. Now we start to think about like, what's the next unit of autonomy. In a computing space, that might be a single data center or single cluster deployment. Um, and that's typically how I would think about it. It's like, OK, I've got the server, I've got the cluster, um, or I've got the data center, um, and then I perhaps have the region. I want the server to be autonomous under normal conditions. I want the data center to be autonomous under normal conditions. It should not require any human intervention to operate effectively, um, which means that it needs effective automation in place. I might want the region to be autonomous, depending on my reliability requirements, um, which means that each each subpart of that network needs to be designed in a way um, that it has enough information locally to be able to continue doing its work if connectivity is interrupted. It needs to have enough data locally to be able to continue doing its work if connectivity is interrupted. And from a grid perspective, um, that's, that's not so very different, right? Like I want you know, any individual EV charging location or any individual battery or any individual uh, smart grid device to be able to do its local work. Um, I want to retrofit onto the network as it stands a lightweight layer of software infrastructure that can do local work within that area. Um, and I want to be able to see what it's doing but not have to necessarily worry about it. Um, and that's where starting to have local infrastructure in place at any particular location, actually let me go back one, um, that takes a little bit of the complexity out of the equation is really helpful. Now, I'm going to talk really quickly about one last design pattern um, and then wrap up. And hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time for questions, although we're running sort of short on that. Um, but the last one I want to talk about is caching. Um, so you know, we, I talked a little bit about design patterns around uh, autonomy of individual devices, around looking at application of technologies for monitoring and load balancing and so forth. But one of the things that really lets us um, not you know, sleep at night when we're thinking about the behavior of our large-scale computing systems is basically you know, their ability to do work locally, their ability to serve locally even under degraded conditions. And that's really what caching gives us, right? It's like a fair amount of local state. It's a capacity buffer. Um, it's something that uh, allows a, an individual location often to ride out interruptions in connectivity or interruptions in service and potentially continue to serve you know, even if the network is momentarily not doing what it should. Um, and this is something that 
Now, as we scale up within a network environment, um, we start to look at very large scale capacity management um, and it becomes complicated in ways that are probably familiar, right? You're moving from a couple of things to a lot of things. Each of them has its own ability to serve locally. Cache helps to support that. It also helps to support the network bandwidth considerations. Um, one of the things that was a really big driver of adding a substantial global caching infrastructure for Google, we basically sort of built our equivalent of Akamai or Fossily or whatever, um, was actually the acquisition of YouTube, where um, the, a major consideration for traffic serving at a global level became the cost of the network um, for any particular interaction. Um, video is an application that is very network heavy. Um, and so like, I like to think about the motivation for developing this much more robust global serving infrastructure as, be, as, as uh, cat videos. It was really for cat videos primarily um, that we had to go through and kind of think about you know, how do you get these individual serving locations, the data centers, the regions to be more and more and more autonomous, to be able to do more and more work without traversing the network or checking back in or needing to pull data from central locations. Um, so that we can serve cat videos in a cost-effective and reliable manner. Um, and so this is where you know, we, we start to look at, uh, in the grid perspective, we start to look at you know, analogs, right? Like what would help these local locations, a small town, a neighborhood, whatever, act independently? What allows them to continue having power if their central connectivity is down? Um, and that's where we start to look at you know, what, what could do that for us? Well, that's a really good role for batteries. Um, we're not necessarily gonna, I think, effectively deploy batteries in a way that is large scale enough to mimic our existing coal generation fleet. Like it's not gonna be gigawatts and gigawatts of central battery capacity sitting out there in the sun somewhere. Um, I think that when we start to, to draw from these examples of distributed systems, um, thinking about the role of batteries in creating more and more autonomous local zones within the grid um, gives us a repeatable pattern that we can draw from and take an example from and start to think about like a model of the grid that's actually hyper-local. It's not then quite as central as the model I first showed you, but perhaps built of a large number of microgrids which can operate independently even when the central connectivity is down at least for a while. Um, and so we start to think about this in terms of you know, really rethinking the large scale systems infrastructure of the grid. Um, and I'll share these slides if you wanna read through them individually, um, but this is probably, I think the specifics are, are more relevant if you're really thinking about you know, working in the grid space yourself. Um, it's the patterns that I want you guys to think about uh, in, uh, in the context of distributed systems design, thinking about distributed systems and applying that work really broadly. And so, you know, as, as we get to that model of a highly distributed, locally autonomous grid that looks a lot more like our software systems, you know, we start to have this view of a future world where, you know, let's say some idiots attack substations in, the, in North Carolina, which happened like yesterday. Um, to, and take down the physical infrastructure that connects um, you know, some 50,000 people to power. Um, those people right now, they might be out of power for months, depending on you know, what the utility can do about bringing in emergency lines. But if their individual communities were operating on localized microgrids, which could behave autonomously, you, know, you begin to have many more tools for dealing not just with the climate challenges, but also with security challenges um, physical infrastructure challenges, and so forth. And so ultimately, while this is not just a software problem, it is a problem where software can play a really important role. Um, and it's also, I think, really important just to kind of center this discussion of architecture and distributed systems um, back in the context of the original problem, right? Like our goal is not necessarily just to have a really fancy grid. Um, the goal is to decarbonize our energy system. And so ultimately, like, these are the tools that allow us to flex demand for energy usage against renewable supply and make sure that as much of our energy as possible is coming from those clean sources and getting us to not just net zero, but like zero, zero. Um, and so this is, you know, it's part of a larger fabric of work, but 
when I, at least when I was researching it, this was the part where I was like, oh, this looks like a problem that, I, that I'm familiar with. This is something that I think we could really help with. Um, and so I think ultimately, you know, there's a lot of, lot of parts of this problem that are sort of you know, similar to things that we've done in the past. There are a lot of parts of it that are different. Um, but by bringing in these like, kind of well-tested technology approaches, um, we reduce the risk of making this transition and making it quickly. You know, it leaves just one or two pieces of magic, right? The rest is, the, the rest is stuff that we understand. So the last letter I'll leave you with is, you know, I, I, I advertise self-driving grids, and do we actually like get to full autonomy? Um, and the, the answer that I would give to that is that at a certain point in automation complexity, you cannot tell the difference. And that's, you know, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and that is our kind of one or two pieces of magic, right? Like ultimately, we are going to continue to build really um, exciting, really groundbreaking, really innovative technology solutions to continue to tackle the complexity of this problem space um, probably throughout the rest of my lifetime. Um, we're never going to run out of fun work to do. Uh, but it's also, as I said in my intro, probably the most important thing I could imagine doing. Um, and I hope that you know, even if you're not particularly interested in the challenges of the grid, that at least you know, this gives you a sense of how you, you know, one might take distributed systems approaches, distributed systems technology and experience and apply it to classes of problems that you really care about, that matter a lot to you, whether it's your company, whether it's your business, whether you've heard my talk today and are like, damn, I want to work in climate. And if you do, give me an email to connect you to people to talk to you. Um, but I think that you know, finding, finding these places to bring together the work that we do every day with the problems that matter most is one of the great privileges of working in tech and working in the industry where we do. Um, and I, I, I hope that in a small way that you know, this contributes to uh, your sense of the real possibility and meaning of the work that you do. Um, and if it, you know, if it leaves you interested in climate, then you know, my, my work here is done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Astrid. That was fascinating, inspiring, all of everything. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, one of the things that kept going around in my head was that when we went from on-premise to cloud, one of the metaphors people would use is like, it's just like a utility, just like electricity. <laughs> um, and yeah, I was, I was having the same reaction. I was kind of laughing because it sounds like almost like the electricity grid now has to become a little bit more like on-premise. And I, I was reading an article about how your EV cars should be charged at work rather than home for efficiencies. And there's a lot of thinking around efficiencies and I was just thinking how much time do you think it'll take for the transition for, um, for this because I feel like the cloud we're sort of on the tail end of that and that was probably 15 years and this seems like maybe a 10 times more or 20 times more difficult problem to <laughs> to solve I don't know I mean I think we'll be working through parts of this problem for a long time um, but a couple of things are, are helpful here. Um, one is that um, there is a fair amount of you know, kind of directed will, um, particularly in the form of both legislation and funding helping to accelerate it. That doesn't necessarily solve any problems by itself, but it doesn't hurt. Um, the biggest is that it's cheaper. Renewables are cheaper, really, really cheap. Um, the system costs are much higher. Um, but I, I think I would have very little faith in making this type of large-scale systems transition if it were also way more expensive, um, but it's not. It's really cheap. Um, just as an example, like one of the utilities that we work with in the US, they're in northern New Mexico, and they set this goal to get to 100% of their local energy from, or sorry, their daytime power from local solar uh, by this year. Uh, when they did that, they cut their energy costs uh, by more than half um, and were able to drop their rates to their customers by half. 
um, they incurred some additional system costs and you know, how they managed their grid and obviously like putting in the infrastructure and all of those things, but it was still so much cheaper that like literally everybody's power bill cut in half. Um, and I think that when you see those kinds of cost advantages, it starts to drive like a, a diverse group of people to come rushing in like magpies to be like, I want some money, I want some money. And that really helps accelerate change. Um, I think 10 to 15 years would be fantastic. And I hope we get through a lot of that, a, a lot of the change that we need to make in that time. Because that puts us into about like 2035 or so, which is actually a pretty good ballpark. Um, if, we, if we were able to make it no faster than the cloud, um, I, I would feel like this was fantastically well done. We have time for one more question. If anyone's looking for a job, they're hiring. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little cheap, but... <laughs> it's all good. All right, uh, join me in thanking Astrid again, um, and we'll have a break. <laughs>